And I'm going to be talking about the coming war with Amalek. I believe the spring of this next year through the spring of 2025, we're prophetically going to see the Isaiah 17 war take place and the Psalm 83 war take place. Are you ready? We're going to look at replacement theology and the Feast of Yom Kippur. And what is Yom Kippur all about? What is Yom Kippur about? Who said atonement? Okay. Why then did Jesus die on Passover and not Yom Kippur? Why did the Lord die on Passover and not on Yom Kippur? I see that hand. Is there another? Yes. Score! You get the prize. Okay. Passover refers to individual salvation. Yom Kippur refers to national salvation of Israel only. Only. That's what it refers to. If you remember the parable of the sheep and the goats all appear before God and he separates the sheep from the goats. Those are not individuals. Go back and read it. It's nations. He's separating the sheep nations from the goat nations. Which nations supported Israel and which ones don't. That is the separation of the nations. On Yom Kippur, Israel would make atonement for themselves. So five days later, the Feast of Tabernacles is about atonement for the nations, the rest of the world. So in one sense, Yom Kippur is the national atonement only for Israel. And I can prove that. It's in your Bible. And then when they made atonement for themselves, like the high priest has to make atonement for himself and his family before he makes atonement for the nation of Israel. Israel, as the head, has to make atonement for themselves as a high priest nation, they in turn then on tabernacles make atonement for the 70 nations of the world, which is why they would kill 70 bulls. They kill a bull on Yom Kippur for themselves and 70 bulls for the 70 nations mentioned in Genesis. Okay, does everybody got it? Okay, so that's what that's about. Now, what has replacement theology done? As we know, it's turned Yeshua from this and do this. Ah! Well, here's the thing. What I want to do is compare the book of Leviticus to the book of Revelation. Everything is a dress rehearsal. In the book of Revelation, do you hear anything about trumpets? The seven trumpets? It's tied to the Feast of Trumpets. And then you're going to see Yom Kippur now in the book of Revelation. And then the next week, I'll talk about the Feast of Tabernacles, where God tabernacles among us in the book of Revelation. It's all tied together. How many of you know that as far as replacement theology goes, they've replaced the priesthood? Look at this. Here are, you'll see these people in colorful clothes. These are their clothes they wear at home. They're the priests, and they're coming, and they're bringing down the stairs a stack of the priestly garments. They have to take their clothes off from home, and they have to put on the white clothes for the priestly garments. 
Now, here you have different types of priestly garments. The high priest would typically look like that except on Yom Kippur. But all the priests would be clothed in white linen. And what is white linen representative of? The righteousness of the saints. That's what it says in the book of Revelation. But the Catholics, when they took over the priesthood, instead of all white, they decided to wear all black. Interesting. They're replacing it. But they have their colorful clothes, too, that they like to wear. Okay. All kinds. So the priestly garments have been replaced. But let's go back. Get rid of that one. <laughs> to the priestly garments. Look at Exodus 28, 4. These are the garments which they shall make. A breastplate, an ephod, a robe, a broidered coat, mitre, girdle. And they shall make holy garments for Aaron your brother and his sons that they may minister unto me in the priest's office. But look what happens on Yom Kippur in Leviticus 16.4. Now he has to put on a holy linen coat, linen breeches, linen girdle, linen mitre. He shall be attired. These are holy garments. Therefore, shall he wash his flesh in water and put them on. So on Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, they would have to take this off and put this on. Again, white represents the righteousness of the saints. And this is why every Yom Kippur, everyone dresses in white. And why here on Yom Kippur, everyone comes wearing something in white. Because white represents the righteousness of the saints. Okay, now, look at Leviticus 16, 8 through 11. This is the Yom Kippur service. And Aaron is to cast lots upon how many goats? Two goats. One lot is for the Lord. The other lot is for the scapegoat. Aaron brings the goat upon which the Lord's lot fell and offers him for a sin offering. But the goat on which the lot fell to be the scapegoat shall be presented alive before the Lord to make an atonement with him and to let him go for a scapegoat into the wilderness. And Aaron will bring the bull of the sin offering, which is for who? Himself. Not for anybody else. And he makes an atonement for himself and for his house. And he kills the bull of the sin offering, which is for who? Himself. Okay, now, so look, at, I'll follow along in these slides now. So here we are. It's early in the morning, Yom Kippur, and they're all getting ready for the morning offerings. And we see the high priest, he brings out these two lots, one for the Lord and one becomes the scapegoat. And here he is, he's holding up the lot for the Lord. This is kind of what it looks like. It says to Adonai. La Adonai. Yud hey vav hey. And so one of those goats has a red sash tied around his horn. And he is led out into the wilderness. But the other one is sacrificed. So off they go with the scapegoat. And they take him east. Like toward China. Okay. They're going that direction. And they're taking him through the wilderness. Over the Mount of Olives down going down to the Judean wilderness and they were you know to take the scapegoat out there but a problem started occurring the scapegoat that had all their sins will go to a neighboring town and they we don't want your sins and they don't want the sins coming back so they decided the solution was to throw it over a cliff so that's what they did and they said that there was the red sash that was tied around one of the little horns, antlers, whatever you want. Well, guess what? They also put a red sash, I don't know if you can see it, on the door of the altar. Now, those doors are not normal doors. Those doors were seven stories high, 75 feet, 25 feet wide. It took like 20 men to open these doors. They were so big, all right? But what happened, and this literally is what happened, for many Yom Kippurs, 
when the goat had gone over the cliff and died, the red sash would immediately turn white. And that's how they knew their sins were forgiven. Now, then what does the high priest do? He takes the bull of the sin offering, which is for himself, and he kills the bull. And then what do we find happens next? Let's look at Leviticus 16, 12 through 15. Then it says, he's to take a censer full of burning coals of fire from off the altar. Okay, what does he do? He takes a censer of burning coals from fire off the altar. The brazen altar that's out there. In this case, it was a big altar. And then he has to go before the Lord, right? I want to put this in your mind. Censer full of burning coals of fire from off the altar. Put that in your head. This is what he has to do. And his hands are full of sweet incense, beaten small and brought within the veil. And then he puts, he's got fire in one hand, incense in the other hand, and he puts them together, which causes all kinds of smoke. Okay, he puts the incense upon the fire before the Lord that the cloud of the incense covers the mercy seat that's upon the ark. So he does not die. And then he takes the blood of the bull and he sprinkles it with his finger on the mercy seat eastward. And before the mercy seat, he's to sprinkle of the blood with his finger how many times? Hmm. And we have seven plagues in the book of Revelation. And then it says, he kills the goat of the sin offering next. That is for the people, and he brings his blood within the veil and does with that blood as he did with the blood of the bull, and he sprinkles it upon the mercy seat and before the mercy seat. So here we go. He now has the incense and the burning coals, and he goes in before the Lord, and he puts it on the mercy seat, and so then the smoke ascends, and then he has to sprinkle the blood seven times now, if you remember, everything that was done in the tabernacle or the temple on earth was a pattern of what is going on where? In heaven, we're not the real, we're the copy. We are the shadow of what's going on, what's really going on up there. Now, here's one thing we do know from Psalm 141, verse 2. It says, let my prayer be set before you as what? Incense and the lifting up of my hands is the evening sacrifice. So the incense on earth is also representative of the prayers that are going on. Okay? So let me see. Leviticus 16 2. And the Lord said to Moses, Speak to Aaron your brother, that he doesn't come at all times into the holy place within the veil before the mercy seat, which is on the ark, so he doesn't die. And I'm going to appear in the cloud upon the mercy seat. Okay, so how often can they go in before the mercy seat? Once a year. That's the only time the ark is seen is once a year. And then God appears in the cloud. Well, the cloud is the prayers of the saints. Now, Verse 34, Leviticus 16. This is to be a temporary statute. Oh, no, no. An everlasting statute to make atonement for who? It doesn't say for all the nations. It's only for the children of Israel, for all of their sins. And it's only done how often? Once a year. Well, now look at Revelation 6.9. He opened the fifth seal, and I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God, for the testimony which they held, and they're crying with a loud voice, How long, O Lord, holy and true, do you not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? Okay. Yom Kippur is the day of judgment. This is why they're crying out on this day. Yom Teruah. The court is in session. Yom Kippur, judgment is meted out. The court is over. Okay? Now, so this is not referring just to Christians. This is mostly a verse from Leviticus where they're saying the same thing. Now, look at 
Revelation 8, 3 through 6. Take a look at this picture here first. Here we go. What's going on earth is happening in heaven. Look at this. Another angel comes and stands at the altar having a golden censer. There was given him much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense which came with the prayers of the saints ascended up before God out of the angel's hand. Look at this. The angel took the censer, filled it with fire of the altar, and cast it into the earth. That's exactly what the high priest does. This is a high priest in heaven who is going through the Yom Kippur service. And it says there were voices and thunderings and lightnings and an earthquake. And the seven angels which had the seven trumpets prepared the cells to sound. Can you imagine? Look at Revelation 11, 15 through 19. They go through the seven angels. The seventh angel sounds. There were great voices in heaven saying, the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Messiah, and he shall reign forever and ever and ever. And the 24 elders which were sitting before God on their seats all fell on their faces. They worship God and they say, we give thanks, O Lord God Almighty, which art and wast and art to come because you've taken to yourself your great power and you have reigned. And the nations, they were angry and your wrath has come and the time of the dead that they would be judged and that you should give a reward to your servants, the prophets, to the saints and to them that fear your name, small and great, and should destroy those who are destroying the earth. And look at this. The temple of God was opened in heaven and there was seen in his temple the ark of his testament and there was lightning and voices and thunder and an earthquake and great hail. You know what that's telling you? This event happens on Yom Kippur. This is a Yom Kippur event and the clouds and there's lightning. And there's thunder. And the ark is seen in heaven. Can you imagine? I just wanted to make a point. <laughs> Anybody sleep when you woke up? Okay. Leviticus 16, 16 and 17. He's making atonement for the holy place because of the uncleanness of the children of Israel. Because of their transgression and all their sins. And he shall do for the tabernacle of the congregation that remains among them in the midst of their uncleanness. Now look at this. Here we're in Leviticus. Note, we're in Leviticus. There shall no man be in the tabernacle of the congregation when he goes in to make atonement in the holy place until he comes out, having made atonement for himself, for his house, and for all the congregation of Israel. Yom Kippur is only for the nation of Israel. So that's Leviticus, right? How many people are to be in the tabernacle when he makes atonement? Well, let's jump to Revelation. We just saw it was during the Yom Kippur. The temple is filled with the smoke from the glory of God and from his power. And no man was able to enter in the temple until the seven plagues of the seven angels were fulfilled. Again, it's a pattern of what's going on in heaven. This is why we know if you don't believe in replacement theology and you connect the dots, you see this event is going to happen on Yom Kippur. Not any other day in history, ever. If you're on God's calendar, which is why I'm promoting the calendar, I want you to be aware of the times and seasons. That doesn't mean six o'clock or winter. You have to know the calendar. This is why. We do this. It's not for us. It's because we want God's glory to be seen. 